Hello and welcome to News Clip today in talking science and tech. We will be discussing the diet of ancient human beings and what new research has found about uh, what human beings were eating and uh, how basically they were eating bread and other grains much before we thought they started eating this. And you know, hunter gatherers they weren't actually just eating meat. They used to eat grains, and you know, they were not really on a carb free carb free diet as was earlier believed. So we're joined by uh, joined with Prabhu Prakashasta. Prabhu, can you first tell us about these findings? How nature, I mean, the nature article which says basically that how uh, how did uh, humans fall in love with bread, beer, and other carbs? Well, uh, it's an interesting heading that the nature article gives that how we got into civilization through beer and bread. But if you leave that part of it out. I think the interesting issue is that there has been a uh, feeling, there has been a supposition that we as hunter-gatherers, since we had not started agriculture, therefore we had a much lower carbs in our diet. And that is something uh, which led to the United States, also to a lot of people in the world. Hey, and I also at one point did look at it seriously, what is called the paleo diet, in the belief the Paleolithic man before the Neolithic revolution did not have a large amount of carbs, carbohydrates in his diet and was therefore much more fruits, nuts and meat kind of person. What we discovered, and this is not only the nature article, but there is also other research which is available, uh, that the, the amount of what would be called vegetables, other fibrous stuff, as well as grains that human beings ate was quite varied. It is not specific that we only had one kind of diet. Depending on where we were, which part of the world we were, what is the fauna, flora and the fauna there, they had varied diets. And the varied diets could also be during the year that you had one kind of diet at one, you know, one you know, time, another kind of diet another time. So the, the kind of ecological niche human beings occupied even before the Neolithic Revolution was much larger than we had assumed. So I think that's an important finding. The other part of it, which I think is equally important, is that we are looking at te technical reconstruction, scientific technical reconstruction, if you will, from numerous sources. And the sources range from what would be called dental plaque, rather gross, but uh, fossilized dental plaque, what is the kind of remnants that are found on the ancient fossils and their teeth. And also, if we look at what are called the grinding stones, how look at the micro etchings, marks, tool marks on the grindstones which are used, and Gobekli Tepe, in which the Nature article uh, talked about, talks about in detail that a huge number of grinding stones have been found. And they analyzed it, the uh, nature of the uh, tools uh, that were used for grinding and what was ground and to what level they were ground. Were they ground into fine powder? Were they ground into essentially uh, broken down uh, grains? And then what was done with it? Were they wet uh, grains that were ground? where the malted grains that were ground, that means you germinate partially and then grind it. So those kind of details, that was that is the other uh, aspect of it. The third, which is interesting, because all of us who cook or try to cook know that we burn things when we cook, particularly if you cook uh, and do other stuff, you're likely to have burnt stuff on, on your in the kitchen. Now, those were initially, or archaeologists used to reject, think the stuff which is of no value. Now, they are providing, and then how you do, how do you find them in the sites, that's another issue. But this burnt material is now finding very, use, is, is very useful in, in terms of looking at what actually was being cooked and what was the method of cooking, and all of that is now slowly giving us a view of our uh, diet, which we didn't have earlier. I think the most important element of this is the belief that it was the Neolithic age and agriculture 
which leads to a shift in our diet. I think that has been shown not to be true. And that the shift in the diet in which we think occurred, in fact, is much older. And when human beings learn to uh, have fire, at that point of time, the diet seems to have had increasing amounts of grain in it as well, and uh, also other kinds of foods in it. But the, the, tra the transition uh, seems to be that you could then boil broken down grains, all of that. Fire seems to have made a much larger range of food available to human beings. That was earlier thought of. So it is not that barbecued meat and uh, was the major element in the diet of the human beings as it is, it is supposed to have been. I think that's a very, very interesting uh, result. But I think the importance of this is also the, the numerous technological adjuncts to research that has, that has happened and how all of them are coming together. And some of them are rather gross, are coming together to make these new discoveries that you just talked about. Right. And of course, as you mentioned, these this uh, remains, these, this evidence of this plant-based diet starting is before the Neolithic age began, before the age of agriculture began. So what do you think this also has to do? This also tells us something about why Neolithic age began at the time that it did? Well, that's, I think, Gobakli Tepe, which is the site from which this grinding evidence that we talked about in the Nature article comes. It's a very interesting site, and I think that's also the reason why this research or this piece of work is very interesting for all of us. We've been looking at the Neolithic revolution, I from the point of view of looking at transition, because I think Neolithic revolution is the major revolution in human society after the use of fire. So that's the real break that we get. And it combines both agriculture and also domestication of animals but more important than that, it starts settled set, you know, it starts human settlements, which are relatively permanent. Before that, you had temporary settlements, but in which you sort of cycle in the seasons. You went in the rainy season somewhere, in winter somewhere, in summer somewhere. So it might be still a cycle you went and re, you know, came back to, but there were still not permanent settlements of the time, the Neolithic Revolution really introduces. So the Neolithic revolution has been of great interest to people who study societies. And uh, therefore, when did it really start? What made it start? The understanding which most people share, that ability to have agriculture or the ability for agriculture is what leads to settled habitations of this kind. And what is coming out is that this is not a sudden uh, revolution in terms of domesticating uh, agri you know, uh, grains, particularly wheat, which was one of the earliest. But what is what happens is that we seem to have known about this relatively earlier. So you know, there's a, the instances of all of this in, as we said, Gorkili Tepe, which is talked about being in Turkey. But since Turkey didn't exist at the time as a as a country, what we are talking about is really a part of the Fertile Crescent. And this is at somewhere in the center of the arc of the Fertile Crescent in Anatolian uh, plateaus, uh, foothills, so to say, the upper rich reaches of the Euphrates Tigris river system. So it's really connected to Syria, Jordan, which would be called Levant in a larger sense. And of course, you have the Euphrates, the Tigris uh, river system, which comes down uh, Iraq and so on. Now, this part of it, and it's really a, the center of the Fertile Crescent, so to say, is a, is a, is a very interesting uh, place that Gobekli Tepe we are talking about. There are others as well. This is not the only one which shows that you start looking at architecture that build, equivalent of buildings existed, people came and there were large vats kind of thing. So the question is, what do they do with these vats? And we now discover they were used for essentially either brewing beer or were also used in cooking porridge. 
So you get porridge and stew and beer. All of these are available. And the interesting part of this, it starts by looking at, not at these vats itself, but also at a field where a large number of grinding stones were there. So it's a, it was called the rock garden. And somebody, a researcher who's Vedic, whose basic paper we are looking at as one of the more important ones, she recreates these grinding stones by grinding different kinds of things in it and looking at the micro indentations. And of course you have the tools for doing it. So then you see that each kind of grain and each kind of preparation needs a different kind of mark on the grinding stone. And from that, trying to recreate what is the food. Of course, you also have the burned food that we talked about, how to look at it. But all of this has made it possible for us to understand that large amounts of grains, broken grains, were cooked in these places. So the initial understanding of the place is that people used to come there. There is a huge number of quote unquote monuments equivalent over there. And it was a temple, it's a religious place. People used to come at certain points of time and used to celebrate with beer and maybe antelope meat, steaks. So this is somewhat uh, the football analogy, if you will, particularly the United States, when people go or park themselves in front of the television camera with food and beer and watch sports. Okay. Now, that was the idea that they have earlier of the Gobekli Tepe. But now that we look at this, it appears that this wasn't really what it was. People stayed there for certain periods. And also, the kind of wheat grains that they find is closely related. They used wild grains. They had not started agriculture as yet. But nearby, there are places where you can see that they were actually... Uh, growing the first uh, domesticated wheat in the whole region, what's called the einkorn wheel. Basically, that was the earliest precursor to all the other wheats we know about, durum wheat or bread wheat, all of this. They were growing that. So it seems to be closely related, though it, is pre it, it predates settled agriculture, because what we find in terms of the remnants of the food that we see, it doesn't seem that einkorn had yet been domesticated, but the einkorn wheat they used was wild, but it is closely related genetically to what was available just a little later in terms of domestication of wheat. So it also gives us that it is not a sudden change. This is about really a little before the Neolithic revolution started. So somewhere near, say, maybe 8,000, 9,000 BCE, 10,000 BC, that you see these structures coming up. And it is one of the earliest and most striking ones, but not the only one. So this is, I think, a very interesting continuity we get, that the domestication of wheat, barley, other things that happened, was not just a sudden transition, that it has a long continuity. And it starts by, of course, using uh, the wheat and uh, other grains, boiling them, making them into porridge, or making them into beer. It's also fermenting it means also preserving it for longer periods. So all of that is what is also part of our diet. So we have been herbivores for much as long as we are also carnivores. That seems to be one of the conclusions that we get. And this is something which we've also seen the Neanderthal diet, which we can talk about a little later, that this is something which long predates what is seen here. The humanity's ability to eat different kinds of food have been much earlier. But this whole research avenue of looking at grinding stone, I find that a very interesting one. Uh, dental plaque we've discussed, we can discuss in the Neanderthal uh, the issue where this, this has been seen or done much more closely. This is other rather gross aspect of the research, which is that fossilized paleophysis called corpolites. Is, is what is also studied. Now, why is that studied? Because from the teeth and uh, all this grinding stones, burned food, we can discover grains which are harder. Therefore, they're not that easily destroyed in terms of uh, age. But vegetable matter, that's rather difficult to see. So the corpolites or paleophyses 
they fossilize and you can discover a lot of the vegetable matter in them. So corpolites is really crapolites, it's just crap. Okay, so that also gives us information about what uh, the paleo human actually consume. So we are getting a picture slowly, reconstructing what was uh, being used in the diet of the uh, just pre Neolithic revolution. And uh, of course, as we know, the Fertile Crescent is one of the earliest in this. Of course, it was paralleled in different places at different times. And it, it not, it's not that every uh, agrarian community owed its roots to the Fertile Crescent. There are independent places where all this has happened. But this was one of the earliest and of course the continuity. We tend now to talk about research papers saying Syria, Jordan, Israel, Turkey, Iran, Iraq and all of that. But it's really one continuum, continuum that you can see in the arc of the Fertile Crescent. And they seem to have parallel communities, which means there was also transfer of knowledge across the region. Uh, maybe roving groups, interaction amongst people, whichever way it is. And I think those will be uncovered as you go deeper into it. But the interesting part is the Neolithic Revolution was just not one striking event which spread everywhere but it had a much longer continuity. And the pre-Neolithic period is also a very interesting period in which we see the transition. And of course, post-Neolithic and you know, is also equally interesting because how do the states emerge from all of it is also an interesting area of research, which we can take over, take, and we can discuss some other day. So I think this is a very, very interesting research area, not because of what the discoveries are merely, but also because of the kind of tools and so the access to new tools that we are seeing and therefore broadening our range of discoveries, range of issues we can examine much, much more. And I think that's a very, very interesting development. So instead of looking at uh, what we think was there in India's past, which there is a group of people who specialize in trying to find all evidence to fit whatever they want to uh, believe in, uh, which is that Aryans all came from India. They were all uh, the proto Aryans were uh, used only speaking Sanskrit from which they spread to all over the world. And the human history is so much more interesting when you look at the multidimensionality of it. And what when you look at all the tools now we have, which can go into this much more than we could earlier. I think that's a fascinating exercise. Right. And finally, talking about Neanderthals, which you mentioned before, we see that, of course, there's evidence of plant-based diet is not just there in ancient Homo sapiens, even in Neanderthals, there is evidence, we found evidence that they used to consume this diet. And not just uh, for uh, food purposes, but you also see evidence of them uh, discovering plant-based medicines and treating themselves with it. So can you, can you tell us about that? Well, that's, again, another fascinating exercise. We have seen this paper earlier that what was the Neanderthal uh, consumption of food and different places that have been there's Spain and other places as well. This has been uh, examined. And again, uh, it was examined by looking at essentially the teeth of people and the tooth plaque that, that accumulates over there, which is fossilized. Now that showed some very interesting examples and what you talked about that we should not be talking about the discovery of aspirin being something we did in modern times, because they seem to have used it for two things, that there is a particular uh, fossil which shows an abscess of teeth, uh, tooth, which is there in the fossil. You can see that. And then you find that in the diet of the person, what you preserve, that it appears that they use a bark of a tree which is known to be rich in acetylsalicylic acid, i.e. aspirin. So that they were using painkillers. We also found they were using that in the diet, there was a kind of mold that was being used. Looks like to treat the abscess because it doesn't, it doesn't seem to be normal in other people's uh, diets. So this person who had an abscess was also using a painkiller and also uh, what would be called a penicillin antibiotic because that's what the mold would have had. So both of this we should credit to Neolithic age 
uh, not to uh, the modern age. Uh, Fleming is not the discoverer of penicillin. Neolithic age seemed to have all discovered it much earlier. So, of course, this we know that plant based medicines were widely used. A lot of modern medicine comes from looking at what they've used, going through it scientifically, rigorously, finding it what works and what didn't work. So, and it is not whether it is Ayurveda or Unani, which are much later. That's not the source of this kind of knowledge. It is really empirical knowledge of the groups and quite often for a set of people within the group and also women who were the natural uh, lo looking at medicinal plants and so on, which we see still in our houses, that the grandmother's remedies, are, that that's what they refer to. So the, this has been a part of the much larger history. And the fact that we find not only plant-based diet, as you see, but also this medicinal plants being used in this particular form, I think it's, it's very, very interesting. What, of course, <coughs> does it does show, if you look across the diets <coughs> of Neolithic, pre-Neolithic population, the Paleolithic population, and now there's evidence coming up from other parts as well, that the human beings occupied a much larger niche in terms of uh, food than we earlier thought. So the hunter-gatherers just didn't hunt and gather food. The fruit and meat diet, the paleo diet, as we were talking about earlier. But they, depending on which place they were, which season it is, they could use a much larger range of foods. And I think particularly the fact they had fire and they could break down a lot of uh, the primary material for food, whether it is uh, uh, what is called the vegetables, the plants, even in terms of meat, that fire was an extremely important element of making a much larger set of foods available to the human population. And therefore, the change of the diet is much earlier than we thought. So when we look at the ability for human beings to consume carbohydrates, we find that our the cousins, the other ones which share 98% of the genetic material, for instance, the chimpanzees and so on, their ability to digest carbohydrates is much lower than ours. And the genetic variation which allows us to do this, that started much earlier than we thought. So I think the combination of uh, looking at different kinds of fossils, dental plaque to crap, to grinding stones combined with the genetic changes within what are in our bodies. And so looking at the, also in the plaque, what is the bacteria which is there, which also tells us of the kind of food that we use. All of this is giving us a picture, which is just enriching our understanding of evolution, the social evolution of human beings because there is a tendency to focus too much on the genetic evolution. But the real important part of it is what is it that we did? What are the tools we used? And ultimately, we are what we are because of the food we ate. So I think all of that combined to give us a much richer history of humanity and its evolution and the social history of that evolution that we would get simply from looking at skeletons, which is all that we did earlier, and saying big head, small head, and so on. So I think that's where I find the current, uh, all this research extremely interesting, because it also brings genetics in. And just today, as we are talking about it, we have found a new uh, skull, uh, which seems to indicate there was a different lineage of Homo sapiens, which also contributed genetic content to Neanderthals, also people in East Asia. And that also brings us that the history of humanity is not as we thought of one lineage breaking up into groups and a kind of tree, but it is a much more dense network where groups split off, but also mated with each other over a much longer period new lineages coming from there. And this seems to fit a hypothesis that in the Neanderthal East Asian lineage, there is a genetic component which we haven't identified as yet. And this could be a part of that 
component. So I think this is something in Asia and Europe is possible also because it's a cold climate in the northern parts of this, uh, this region. So the fossils are much better, much easier to get them better stay. When it comes to Africa, South Asia, hotter climates, we are going to have a more of a problem because the fossils are not that easy to get. Numbers are less, degradation of the material is much more. So, but the way, the speed at which archaeology uh, of this kind allied to different scientific uh, tools that are becoming available, I think we have a very exciting history that is going to unfold before us. Maybe I'm only seeing the beginning of it, but I think your generation is going to see the change of human history, at least the prehistory, pre-Neolithic revolution, what happened, and also understanding the social changes of the Neolithic period and the cities. I think all of this we'll have to rewrite. Not that we'll have to rewrite completely because I don't think the major findings will change, but I do think the understanding of how it happened and why it happened is going to see significant changes. And this is really one more example of the gathering of this kind of information, combining it with our understanding of history. And this is exciting times for archaeology, the discipline of archaeology, rather than the discipline of history, which focuses much more on the written word. And therefore, the text combines with all the archaeological evidence. Here we have nothing left of the text. We don't know what languages are spoke. That's not preserved. But what is preserved is what they did and what they ate. And I think that's that's the exciting part of this, this part of our discoveries. Right. Thank you, Prabhu, for joining us today. And that's all the time we have. Keep watching your script. Thank you.